Hey guys, I am live. It's nine. Well, it's nine my time. So I will just wait for a few minutes to let people join if they're going to join and then we will get this question and answer show on the road. So um, usually I go live on Fridays at nine every week. So if you can't stick around the whole time, I almost always go live every Friday morning. I try to make that a weekly thing. And then I also go live on Wednesday nights at 5 p.m. PST. So, um, and it's just for a Q&A. So I open it up for questions and answers and you guys can ask me whatever. And uh, we just chat about wellness. We go in depth into certain issues, um, just so you guys can better understand what might be going on with your body. So that's kind of why I do these lives, but I didn't really announce this one, so we'll see how many people join. But regardless, this will be available for 24 hours and then posted on YouTube. So if you guys miss my lives, um, uh, they're always going to be posted for you later on. Um, but yeah, so I'll just wait if questions come in, um, and then if I, um, don't have a lot of questions, I'll go over how to take your temperatures and pulses, because I've been getting quite a lot of questions on that. How is the red light therapy going? It's really good. Um, I, like, uh, was in the market for a red light therapy device for a while, and I just, like, could not pull the trigger on a juve, um, as much as people were promoting them. I'm just like, this is so expensive. Expensive. <laughs> like I don't know if I can just do it um, and uh, then I kind of started looking into the science and just like digging into the wavelengths and I realized that one of those grow lights is almost as many nanometers as a regular like a juve or red lightman um, it's 660 whereas like a juve is 800 so it's I mean yeah the juve goes a lot deeper but you're totally paying way extra for that so the red light therapy is going really good. I've been doing it every single morning and every single evening um, for multiple reasons, just for health reasons, not just for hair growth, but I thought it would be kind of fun to see if um, it helps regrow hair. Uh, I've been using it with clients for a while and they really enjoy it. And um, I just haven't had the time really to put one together, like and actually pull the trigger on it. So um, yeah, it's going really good. It feels really good. It's not warm. Like a lot of people think they're like warm. They're not warm um they are um but they kind of penetrate like deep within your cells so a lot of times people even say that they can feel like the warmth inside <laughs> coming outside inside from inside their body inside their cells okay what do you put in the green broth um, I usually use a, uh, a recipe called Beeler's Broth. You can type that in on Google, B-I-E-L-E-R-S, Beeler's Broth. Um, you can also, like, I just recommend, like, for a green broth, you use lots and lots of greens. So whatever greens you like, kale, cabbage, um, bok choy, um, collards, mustard greens, um, just a ton of them, herbs, so basil, parsley, cilantro, and then you could put other vegetables if you want, carrots, celery, ginger, um, anytime you do garlic or onions, you just have to be aware that you need a more robust gut to handle those things. So if you have um, an intolerance to broths or you have like a histamine intolerance or something like that, you might do better with broths that don't have garlic and onions just because they're so potent. Um, but you can totally throw them in for flavor and then you always want to add like a nice splash of apple cider vinegar and a good amount of salt and there's your greens broth I usually like to do just a double whammy and make my bone broth have a lot of greens in it just so I can have the minerals from both the bones and the greens in my broth so I don't have to make two separate broths but um yeah you can absolutely just do a greens broth or just do a mineral broth I mean a bone broth how to figure out when I'm ovulating, I'm perimenopausal and on cycles. Yeah, this is why I'm always recommending you gotta track your temperatures, you gotta practice the fertility awareness method. Um, you know, you take your temperature upon waking and remember you always get a temp spike after you ovulate because after you ovulate, within about 24 hours, your body starts to make progesterone and then that will directly affect the thyroid and raise your body temperatures to about like one or uh, 0.6 to one whole degree. So you will see a spike after you ovulate and you will start to see patterns, but you know, you have to track 
a couple cycles to see the pattern. Um, but you know that after you got that spike, you ovulated 24 hours before. So um, whenever you get that temp spike mid cycle around mid cycle, uh, that's when you ovulated. Um, that's, you know, regardless of if you have regular or re irregular cycles, even if you have regular cycles, you cannot predict your ovulation. That is a lie from the pits. If you're just using an app to track ovulation, you that app doesn't know when you ovulated. Are you kidding me? So the only surefire way to know you're ovulating is to track your temperatures. And then even if so, let's say you're getting really sporadic temperatures and you're like, I'm not really sure if I am or not then that would be the time to get a progesterone test done around five to seven days after you think you're ovulating. And your progesterone levels should be at least above five. If they're below five, a lot of times that means that you're probably not ovulating, um, but optimally they should be below, I mean above eight. Um, mid luteal phase. So the, the most surefire way to see if you're ovulating is to see if you have progesterone mid luteal phase. Um, but a temperature spike and tracking your, your temperatures is pretty dang uh, accurate way of, of checking if you're ovulating. Can you also do test strips for ovulation? Yeah, so you can use LH strips, like just an ovulation test strip. You can buy them on Amazon or at a drugstore. Um, absolutely. Um, the only thing is sometimes it can be confusing, especially if you have PCOS or hormonal imbalances, because remember that estrogen can affect luteinizing hormone, and that's what those test strips strips are testing. They're testing for luteinizing hormone. And so sometimes, like specifically in polycystic ovarian, syndrome but then other hormonal imbalances as well you can find that you're getting this um, like you're getting like LH readings but you're not getting like a full LH reading and that's because um, luteinizing hormone is going to be affected by estrogen and a lot of women with PCOS are having maybe high PCOS or high luteinizing hormone or low luteinizing hormone and so it can be a little confusing so that's why I do recommend just getting familiar with your cycles um, and when you're a lot of times women don't really know their bodies really well so they start like doing those ovulation strips and they're just unsure they're like I don't know if I ovulated so honestly using those temperatures and the ovulation strips together is a much more accurate way than just using the uh, the test strips what is a good pre and post workout snack or meal so I think that every meal and snack except for your bedtime snack should have protein carbs and fat so um, uh, like I use um, my little de-stressing creamsicle before a workout, so that's going to be six to eight ounces of fresh squeezed orange juice, a cup of raw milk, two tablespoons of collagen, and a fourth a teaspoon of salt shaken up in a mason jar. That's like my go-to meal snack. That's my go-to if I'm like really stressed out or I don't have time to make a snack, um, and that's also a really good pre-workout meal um, and then I try to eat a really like a solid meal uh, about an hour or less after a workout so um, it really depends on when you're working out so a lot of people ask this question and I'm like it really depends on the time if you're working out mid-morning that's gonna look a lot different than if you're working out during dinner time you know so you kind of have to plan your workout schedule and then plan your meals accordingly for example I go to work out after I eat breakfast. So breakfast is my pre-workout snack. I don't have to eat a snack before I work out. Um, but somebody else who might go work out at 3 p.m., they just got off work, haven't eaten since noon, they need to eat something before that workout, and then you would just eat dinner afterwards, you know, because that's going to be around dinner time. So it's really just about kind of seeing what your eating schedule is like or, or what your nutrient timing is, and then that's when you can actually go and... Um, uh, kind of plan your pre-workout snack but every single meal and snack needs to have protein fat and carbs protein fat and carbs like I will continue to say that and just like drive you guys crazy because it always needs to have the three macronutrients the only time you don't do that is before bed you want a snack before bed that is only carbs and fat because protein can disrupt your quality of sleep and so uh, that's the only time where I say um, be a little bit more conservative on the protein and a little bit more um, heavy on the carbs and fat but you never do carbs alone and you never do protein alone those are two big no-no's because protein is going to drop your blood sugar too low 
low and carbs are going to spike your blood sugar too high and so we don't want either thing happening both of those states are very stressful to the body the body has to compensate in those positions we never want to put our body in that position and so it's best to try your best and I'm not saying it's going to be perfection there's going to be times where it's like I'm either going to not eat or I'm going to eat an, an imbalanced meal and you're going to always choose to eat over the imbalanced meal but um, your goal and your responsibility is for most of the time to never put your body in a position where it has to break itself down in order to make fuel. So beautiful today, radiant. Oh, thank you guys. I actually got a ring light and so it's not me. It's just the ring light. Like I finally got one because I was relying so heavily on sitting in front of a window and like some days the light was just like so dark because it's dark outside and I was like, I just want like some solid light. So I finally bought a ring light. <laughs> You mentioned drinking your coffee after a meal the other day. Why is that? I'm a black on an empty stomach kind of girl and I'm having a hard time breaking that habit. Yeah, so we're one of the worst habits, I'm sorry to say. Um, black on an empty stomach is like recipe for hormonal disaster because you guys have to remember, we live in a very stressful env environment. We have all these people preaching about a low, a low carb diet, which in itself is very stressful on the system. And maybe in a perfect world where we weren't exposed to environmental stressors, work stressors, relationship stressors. I mean, we just live in a stressful world, you guys. We go and scroll on social media and an hour later we have anxiety about the fact that we can't travel for a living. You know what I mean? And so, um, we don't need to add more stress in the form of certain diets or certain foods. Caffeine on an empty stomach is so difficult on the body unless you have perfectly functioning hormones. If you have incredible resilient blood sugar balance then go for it but most people don't sorry to say and so you know you have to understand that if uh, uh, coffee and caffeine is a metabolic enhancer. That's, that's a good thing, right? We want our body warming up. We want our cells working more efficiently. We want all those B vitamins and all the minerals coming from that coffee to fuel our cells. But, 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 when we speed up our metabolism and we don't have any fuel to fuel, it's like pushing the gas pedal on a Ferrari and having no gas in the tank. That's not a good thing. So you got to think of it that way is that you need fuel in your system and people that have horrible blood sugar balance cannot handle caffeine at all. They, um, and then there's like a spectrum in between. So there's people that are like, well, I feel fine drinking coffee, but then they're like have anxiety, their hair's falling out, they get jitters, they're irritable. And I'm like, you're not okay with caffeine. Like, <laughs> let's not be fooling yourself. So, um, caffeine is going to affect your blood sugar if you have no fuel in the tank and, uh, and your tank, what's your, your, what's your tank? Your tank's your liver. Your, your, your liver is the battery pack of the body. And what happens is Eight hours goes by because we're sleeping, right? Fasting, we're fasting while we're sleeping. And then by the time you wake up, most women, I'd say nine out of 10 right now who have imbalanced hormones or are not doing really well hormonally, their stress hormones already started spiking at 3 a.m. to start breaking down their tissues to keep blood glucose stable because lots of women are under eating throughout their whole day. So, you know, let me give you this picture. You wake up in the morning, you drink your black coffee, your blood sugar is immediately imbalanced starting your day off. Woohoo! Then we eat a scant breakfast, maybe we wait till 11 a.m. Our liver's already having to make its own fuel. We started the day off forcing our liver to make its own fuel, but the liver was already empty. And then by maybe lunch, we have like maybe a chicken salad. Where's the carbs? Where's the glucose to fill your liver up? 150 grams of glucose is needed at all times to keep blood sugar stable without using stress hormones. And then by di by dinner time, we're starving, we're craving things, we pound all this food, We our blood sugar spikes up because we're so starving, I don't blame you, and then we go to bed and then we do it all over again. And our liver's like, what the actual hell? And so this is why I'm always talking about uh, competent meal timing. The minute you wake up, eat something with protein, carb, and fat then drink your coffee and make sure there's a fat in there. You do not want to drink black coffee on an empty stomach. Um, and then and then you're gonna eat a snack two hours later and then two hours later and so on and so forth. And then you're gonna eat a bedtime snack before you go to bed to fill up your liver stores so that when you wake up, you're not already 
starting the day with stress hormones high. So I hope that makes sense. But yeah, black coffee on an empty stomach is, is, is great in theory for people who are metabolically resilient. But if you're struggling with any type of hormonal imbalances, digestive issues, um, anxiety, sleeplessness, low progesterone, blah, 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 this goes on and on. Unfortunately, it's just not a great way to start your day. I mean, you're starting your day with um, stress and it's most likely causing you to the next day start your day with stress and so on and so forth. So coffee, metabolically enhancing. I say go for it, but you got to do it the right way, especially when you're hormonally um, imbalanced. And some women do find that cutting out coffee for a while while they're getting their, their blood sugar balanced is beneficial to them. That does not mean coffee is bad. It means that their, their body was in a state of such imbalance that it couldn't really tolerate the metabolic benefits of caffeine. Because if you don't have the fuel to burn, um, you, you don't want to be pushing the gas on the pedal. Because of high cortisol, I deal with low blood sugar. You suggested eating every two hours. What are some good food pairings for snacks? So that little adrenal creamsicle that I talked about, that's like my go-to drink. Six to eight ounces of fresh pressed orange juice. The reason I use orange juice, you guys, is because it's very rich in potassium. A lot of people blame insulin for blood sugar imbalances, but actually in reality, potassium plays a larger role in how your cells uptake um, blood glucose than insulin does. Insulin just gets a bad rap, but people don't look at the whole picture. Most women are deficient in potassium. They're running through potassium so quickly. They don't even understand that their needs for potassium are so incredibly high. And a lot of women are not eating potassium rich foods when they cut out all sugar. So when they cut out all sugar, I'm like, where are you getting your potassium from girl? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, that's why your blood sugar is so imbalanced. And so that's why I really regularly implement orange juice. It's just so rich in potassium and it's very cooling to the stress response. And it actually doesn't affect blood sugar when you combine it with a protein and fat. So 68 ounces of orange juice. Um, and then it's also anti-estrogenic. That's why I use it. And then two tablespoons of collagen one cup of raw milk or two tablespoons of raw cream or coconut cream, whatever you prefer, and then as much salt as you can handle. Shake that up in a mason jar, carry it with you everywhere. To me, that's like my go-to. Sometimes I'll have it for both snacks every day. I enjoy it, first of all, and second of all, it's just something that's so easy for me and I'm like all about that quick and easy. But if you're like, I want something a little bit more substantial, sometimes I'll do like an epic bar or a grass-fed beef stick with fruit. That's a good quick meal. Um, I'll do like some um, Parmesan cheese or raw cheddar um, with fruit. I usually, like I just think that fruit is such a fast food. It's so easy to like grab a nectarine or a peach really quickly and then slice some cheese and head out the door. Or, you know, that's just a very easy combination combination. Um, cottage cheese and fruit. I, I like using dairy as my snacks because it's very like it's such a nutrient dense food and it's so balanced with protein, carb, and fat. It has that saturated fat which is just so good for metabolism and it's just easy to digest and absorb if you tolerate it well. So that's why I'm like heavy on the dairy products for my snacks but some sometimes I'll do like two hard-boiled eggs and a piece of sourdough toast or um, again fruit. I very regularly use fruit for my snacks just because it's something that again is super easy easy and there's so much variety. Um, I'll do applesauce, like I'll make some homemade applesauce and then I'll add coconut oil and collagen to that for my protein and fat. Because again, you never at, eat carbs without protein and fat. Um, or I'll do like a small little smoothie with you know, mango or whatever frozen fruit I have on hand, I like to kind of mix it up. And then I'll add some raw milk and I use whole raw milk. So there's enough fat in there. I don't have to add another fat source. And then I'll add like some collagen to that as well. So I try to just make my snacks very quick and easy um, or I'll do bone broth. And again, I'll blend that with coconut oil or ghee and um, add some collagen. Um, but bone broth is pretty rich in protein. So I just kind of keep it really balanced. I try not to do nut heavy. Uh, you guys know I'm not like a huge fan of nuts, like I don't avoid them um, completely, but I try not to do a nut heavy diet um, because I do feel better without nuts and I <laughs> gain weight like crazy on nuts and I find that most women do. So it's kind of one of those things where I just try to really keep it very simple. I'm someone that's like, I don't want complicated. If it's complicated, I won't do it. And I find that a lot of women are that way. So. That's kind of where I stick to. Um, if you can do like a little bit of grains, like sometimes I'll do those organic rice cakes. Um, like I like the kettle corn ones with a little avocado on top. You know, I just try to like keep it balanced, but also keep it to something I enjoy. 
Um, I have normal levels of everything except androgens, which are high. What could be the cause? You know, whenever you say, like, I have normal levels, I always, like, most people that tell me they have normal levels but they have symptoms, they come to me and their levels are not normal. They're normal by conventional standards, but they're not normal by functional standards. So, um, but if truly everything is normal and your progesterone levels are above 8 nanograms per deciliter um, and your estrogen levels are not high at the two spikes in your cycle. Remember, estrogen spikes pre-follicular phase and it spikes a little, a couple days after you ovulate. And so remember, testing is very relative to when you got tested in your cycle. You can't just get tested whenever and say, oh, my hormone levels are normal. That means nothing. It just means nothing. Um, but testosterone levels are usually high because there's lots of estrogen hanging around in the body and the tissues. Remember, the bloodstream is just a snapshot. Um, the bloodstream is a highway for hormones. It's not like where they're stored. So when people say like, oh, my blood tests were normal, I was like, who cares? It, that was a snapshot in time. Um, that doesn't tell me what they are right now. That doesn't tell me what they are tomorrow. So that's why you always have to track your symptoms. And this is why, again, I always recommend temping, or doing temperatures and pulses because it tells you so much more than a blood test will ever tell you. Blood tests are great. They're a great kind of base point, baseline, but they're not the end of the story. When people act like, oh, I'm still having symptoms, but my blood tests are normal, so I'm just gonna go on with my life. I'm like, no, no, no. Blood tests are just the beginning, just the beginning. And whenever something doesn't feel right, you dig deeper. You don't just say like, okay, that's the one thing. So androgens are usually high due to um, high estrogen in the tissues and lots of inflammation. Testosterone and DHEA are very protective. Um, they're the only thing more powerful than estrogen. That is wh why our heart cells, our lung cells, and our brain cells cells are very rich in testosterone and DHEA because remember I always talk about this when your stress hormones are high the main priority of that is for your body to break itself down specifically the tissues muscle tissue collagen tissue skin tissue to send those tissues to the liver to be converted into blood glucose to keep blood glucose levels stable because in a high stress state the body's job is to keep you functioning. Your body's not like, oh, I expect you to sit down for a full course dinner before you run from an angry bear. Because that's what your body thinks is when you're in a high stress state, there's an acute stressor. You're running from an angry bear. You're in danger. And so your body knows you're gonna need quick fuel and you're gonna need it now. And so it's smart for the body to do that, right? To break itself down so that you don't have to stop and digest and break down things for fuel to keep yourself running. Your body has that quick force, source of fuel. And that's very helpful for when you're running from an angry bear. But let's say you're running from an angry bear 24 seven, seven days a week, all the time, that gets really dangerous. And so your body has set up mechanisms to protect your most vital organs, AKA your heart, your lungs, and brain, which you cannot break down. Eventually you do break it down. And in my opinion, that's called like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, but that I'll save that for a different day. Um, but you know, your body tries to protect you as long as possible from those stress hormones. And we don't, we don't want to see stress hormones as bad necessarily. That is your body's protective mechanism, but you need to understand that that's mostly being driven by stress. And then it can also be driven by blood sugar imbalances, which again are driven by stress. <laughs> so when your blood sugar is imbalanced um, and your blood sugar is spiking high and then low, high and then low, you're going to have higher insulin levels. Your insulin is going to be all over the place. And that is, um, um, the body's hormone that allows it's like a key that allows blood sugar into the cells and when the when the cells are inflamed when they're under stress they don't have the nutrients they need they're getting a lot of toxins from the gut they will not use glucose and they'll prefer free fatty acids and so that's why glucose and insulin hang around in the blood and insulin can make the ovarian cells pump out more testosterone as well so all of this boils back down to stress and inflammation and and liver issues coming from the gut. So that's why, again, I've kind of boiled all these issues down to like main five things. And I always focus on those five things because I find that when we focus on those five things, all the other symptoms that are stemming from those things 
go away because we're actually asking why are all these hormonal imbalances are happening instead of like focusing on all these hormonal imbalances like even functional medicine doctors sometimes they're like oh you have high testosterone let's take some salt palmetto and i'm like whoa 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 your body has high testosterone for a reason it's protecting you and if we go to lower testosterone what are we actually doing to you long term no 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 we have to actually ask why the testosterone is high dig deeper get to the bottom of it and the body takes care of it itself so, you know, I just have a different, I, I understand and I see that the body's super wise. It doesn't just forget to do something one day. It's not like, oopsie, I'm attacking myself all of a sudden. Like, oopsie, like, oops. Your body is not an oops type of thing. Your body has to closely regulate every single mechanism in your in inside or you would die. <laughs> and um, to act like the body just forgets how to do something is, is absolutely ludicrous to me. So when we see high or low, low hormones, we always need to ask ourselves, where's the stress coming from? Where's the stress? And so I think testing sex hormones without testing stress hormones is, is useless. And um, that's why I always recommend when you get your sex hormones test, you also tested, you also need to test your stress hormones cortisol, prolactin, adrenaline, and then you also need to test your thyroid because without testing those two things, your sex hormones are absolutely useless. From my period until ovulation, I feel ramped up. Tons of energy, metabolism feels on fire, high sex drive, but from ovulation to period, it's the opposite. So sluggish, bloated, etc. Is this abnormal? Yes, it's abnormal, and it's usually a sign of low progesterone. So, um, you know, when you ovulate, you're supposed to start making progesterone. Some women don't even realize, uh, I'm assuming that you're ov you know you are ovulating. If that's the case, really track how long your luteal phase is. So remember, a proper luteal phase should last about 11 to 14 days. That means that, because remember, so what happens, and I hope every one of you has watched my story on the menstrual cycle. And I told you guys at my last live, I'm going to go through and get rid of all the stories that no longer represent my current views on nutrition, because I've shifted a lot. Like the, some of those stories are like two years old. So I need to go in and like, and I'll redo some of those stories. But there's one that in particularly that I still just it, it's spot on and that's the one labeled menstrual cycle every woman needs to watch it because every woman needs to understand exactly what's going on throughout their whole menstrual cycle it's not just your period your menstrual cycle refers to that whole cycle and so when you go to drop that egg during ovulation the emptied egg sac becomes a gland itself in about 24 hours called the corpus luteum you have to understand that growing a gland like that within 24 hours takes incredible amounts of nutrients think about growing a hormone gland within a day You're, you don't even realize it's happening yet your body's literally growing a gland that's going to secrete progesterone for 11 to 14 days and so knowing that you need to understand that if your luteal phase is very short six days seven days it's not lasting that 11 to 14 days that shows you that your corpus luteum is is disintegrating a lot faster than it should be and that also shows you that you're most likely not making enough progesterone because if your corpus your progesterone levels are only as good as your corpus luteum and so i would encourage you to check out you know when you're ovulating in your cycle how long is your luteal phase lasting and then if it's lasting less than 11 14 days Days, you most likely have low progesterone because progesterone is that hormone that kind of starts to kick in mid cycle and then you need to eat everyone needs to remember this is why I focus so heavily on liver detox because when you ovulate you um, a couple days before you ovulate you have that estrogen spike right and then when you ovulate you you have a spike of both progesterone and testosterone and then a couple days later you have another estrogen spike and so think about all these hormones coming into the picture they are all good, but your liver has to take care of them, clear them, handle them. All those old hormones have to be detoxified, broken down, put into the bile, carried out of the body. And when those systems are not working properly, when your liver's stressed out or your gut's not clearing hormones properly, they will become recirculated and you'll feel like absolute shiat. And the, the thing that usually doesn't get detoxified properly because it's the hardest is estrogen. And so a lot of times when women are really feeling crappy that second half of their cycle, I'm saying, well, you know, your, your body only had to deal with a few hormones before ovulation, but then more hormones were introduced after ovulation, your body's not clearing them well. So the two things I recommend in a, in a situation like that is to make sure you're ovulating and having a corpus luteum that's lasting you 11 to 14 days, which will kind of show, okay, I'm making enough progesterone or I'm making a good amount 
And then the second thing is make sure your liver is supported during that second half of the cycle. And I would almost start with your liver detoxification strategies, at least for a couple months, right after you stop bleeding. So the minute you stop bleeding, your job kicks in and it's time to really focus on detox so that when you ovulate, your liver is already going. You know what I mean? Some women, they make the mistake of like until after they ovulate, not focusing on their liver until after. And I'm like, well, there's already hormones kind of coming into the picture. And so we want to kind of get the liver functioning even before all these extra hormones are, are being produced. So I hope that helps. I'm hoping that it's one of those two things. Um, it can be other things, but that's kind of usually the main thing is when someone's feeling crappy the second half of their cycle, it's usually due to um, just improper liver detoxification and the fact that more hormones are being uh, produced and the body's not clearing them correctly. How to tell if we have candida? Um, you guys, the best way to test if you have candida is to test, get a gut test done. Because there's other yeasts besides candida. A lot of people think that like candida is the only yeast you can have. <laughs> and there are other forms of yeast um, that should be kind of treated the, a different way. And there's no really way of knowing until you get tested. But kind of like a good, I guess, like self-test is the spit test. You take a cup of water and the minute that, um, like just get a little glass of water, um, and put it by your bed, and the minute you wake up, you're gonna take hawk a I know, yummy, and spit in that glass. Try to do it very gently. And if you start to see lots of like stringy, you're gonna just let it kind of like um, sit there for like 30 minutes, don't mix it up, just let it sit, and watch what happens to the saliva. If you start to get these like stringy, like, uh, projections, there's something going on in your gut. Because remember, your saliva is full of the bacteria. The mouth is the flower of the gut. And so whatever's going on in the gut is going to crawl up while you're sleeping. And so this spit test will kind of show you, but you can Google it, do the candida spit test. It will tell you kind of all the details to kind of what to watch for in your spit. There's so many resources about that. That's a good starting point. Um, but it's not like rocket science. So um, it's a good kind of starting point. And if you see that your saliva or you have t white tongue when you wake up, like really white, you got a coating on your tongue, that's a good sign that there's some gut issues going on for sure. But most women with PCOS have some sort of gut imbalance. Um, I would just assume that's the case. Um, and uh, I would assume that's the case in any metabolic issue. So thyroid issues, um, imbalanced blood sugar, adrenal issues, almost always you guys like i i haven't seen a case where the gut's like wonderful like ooh that gut is just perfect there's almost always something going on some more than others but usually there's something best foods and supplements to care for your liver right after a night of drinking yeah so i always recommend doing bitters before and then you always want to take a b vitamin before you go out drinking and then after you go out drinking but i want you guys to understand just because something's legal does not mean it's any less harmful than an illegal substance and i know this is a unpopular opinion but alcohol is a toxin it is a metabolic toxin your body has to prioritize uh, detoxifying alcohol over everything else and so let's say your body is having a huge estrogen load and your body's so stressed that about is trying to get that estrogen out and then you go out drinking that night your body has to put all that estrogen into your fat cells which can expand to 10 to 15 times their size in order to process that alcohol because it can't hang out in the liver it has to go back into circulation and so for women who are struggling with hormone imbalances I just remind you that alcohol is so harsh on your body it is so harsh um, and um, obviously you know we live in a real world so I'm not gonna say don't drink but I'm gonna say just keep it in mind um, drinking especially when you're in a very compromised hormonal state can be like a make-or-break situation but to kind of mitigate the effects on the liver take some bitters beforehand take a really good B complex before you drink and then after you get home um, I also I personally take two aspirin before I go to bed um, because aspirin is going to help the liver and um, also it's going to prevent a hangover. And then the minute you wake up, I, I do a like a, a ginger uh, tea um, for inflammation and I eat right when I wake up because remember that you, this is why you get so hungry is when your liver's processing things, you're, you need extra fuel. Your liver is going to need extra fuel. Remember your liver relies, it is a incredibly metabolically, energetically um, consu consuming organ. And so it totally needs so much 
lunch fuel and so eat a huge breakfast when you wake up you want to mitigate the effects at night so when you wake up you can get back to eating quickly because if you're um like oh i don't feel good i don't want to eat that's the worst thing you can do is eating fruit alone okay for snacks or does fat need to be added Fruit alone is a no-no, guys. It's just carbs alone are always a no-no. Uh, especially, it, okay, I don't want to say always. I want to say if you are metabolically, uh, you have a metabolic stability and you're like, I'm good, don't have weight to lose, don't have energy issues, don't have mood issues, don't have PMS issues, don't have headaches, you're perfect, which I'm sure you're probably not because you're here, then you can eat fruit alone. But if it's none of those things, fruit cannot be eaten alone. No macronutrient should be eaten alone. That goes for protein, that goes for carb, and that even goes for fat. I don't see the reason to eat fat alone. So um, you always wanna do carb, protein, and fat. That's why I always combine fruit with like string cheese or cottage cheese or some Greek yogurt or just something quick, like it doesn't have to be hard. Um, but you always wanna combine it with a fat. And I prefer saturated fats because I know the science behind that and I know that saturated fats are gonna help you burn that glucose like really really well whereas polyunsaturated fats like for example combining that fruit with nuts is going to be a lot harder for your body to process so um one of my favorite things to add to fruit is like i just eat a tablespoon of coconut butter and there i just had my fat um sometimes i'll melt that coconut butter in with some collagen to make like a little bit of a paste and i'll drizzle it over some sliced fruit and it gets all hard it's almost like a cinnamon roll or something it's really good so um you always want to eat fruit with um fat and protein especially when you're metabolically unstable you can't handle carbs really well hi jess i'm going to disney for a couple days can't figure out what snacks to bring i won't be able to cook any ideas lots of fruit <laughs> not to not to say what i just said again um i do lots of epic bars or grass-fed beef sticks like the sticks you can get them at sprouts or whatever your local health food store is um i do hard boiled eggs especially if you have a fridge like that can be really helpful but they keep pretty well in a cooler um i'm trying to think of what else like carrot sticks um celery sticks red pepper um i do like sprouted hummus or you can make your own like zucchini hummus or pumpkin hummus like you can make hummus out of um, squashes too you don't have to make them out of beans but sometimes I'll just do hummus just be careful of the oils in hummus um, uh, doing a small amount of legumes is fine but like when you start to um, add like some canola oil to that then that's not fine um, so I recommend like opting for a sprouted hummus or um, guacamole is helpful it just really depends on if you have a refrigerator and if you don't then like coconut butter packs can be helpful nut butter packs are fine in a pinch like it's one of those things where you kind of have to weigh like um would I prefer to eat that or would I prefer to see eat something that I bring and usually something that you bring is far superior um like almond flour crackers or um like a uh, Potato chips fried in coconut oil can be great, or sweet potato chips, or um, I'm trying to think of what else. <laughs> oh, um, there's like those little fruit squeezies, which can be good in a pinch, like the little um, ones kind of made for kids and babies, but who cares, right? Um, those can be really helpful. Just make sure they don't have any like added sugars or added grains in them, because some of them are like quinoa, strawberry, and like, ew. Um, so, um, and I'm sure the babies are like, ew, too. They're like, what is this shit, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so you can get like, I always keep things really simple. I'm sorry, I'm not the best about like these like very like crazy snacks, because I just think it's like, it comes sometimes becomes more complicated. Um, and then I always do my, my orange creamsicle drink i just make a huge thing of it and like three or four servings and bring it with me but again that really depends on if you have like a cooler or a refrigerator best thermometer that you would recommend um hold on i have one right now in my office let me grab it <clears throat> sorry guys um i'll just show you right now so this is the one i bought on amazon it's super cheap and just like it's pretty good to me it's called um provane Provain, um, and it's like Amazon's top choice. It has like a, a bendy, um, a bendy, and it's very quick. It's very accurate. So um, I just use like a cheap basal body thermometer. I've been meaning to get myself a temp drop, which is like, it's a wearable armband that like goes into your armpit. But I just haven't gone around to it. It is pr kind of pricey, and I'm like, this does the trick. So I just use like a basal body thermometer, and then um, for taking my pulls, I use an oximeter. Um, this one's the Anovo. 
but you don't need one. You can obviously take your pulse manually. It, it's just, I like it because it's easy. Like I can go about my day while I'm measuring my pulse or I can stick it on to see how certain things are affecting me. So it's really cool like to wear this and do like deep breathing. You can really see your pulse immediately go down. Like you can see the immediate effects of certain things on your body and it's kind of a fun way to be like, wow, that lowers my stress quite a bit really quickly within seconds. So it's, it's a helpful tool for sure. Uh, how many grams of carbs from good sources do you eat per day? Well, I'm trying to think of, I don't really track, like sometimes I'll track intermittently just to kind of check in to make sure I'm eating enough because I really don't believe in maximums. I believe in minimums for sure. And I do find that um, people don't like learn to tap into their symptoms, but I've done this for so long that like if my hair is falling out a lot more than normal that day, I probably didn't eat enough. Or if I'm a little bit more irritable than normal or tired than normal, how did I do the day before? Like what did I eat the day before? And usually I'll find, oh, I didn't eat enough fuel. I didn't eat enough carbs. Um, I like transitioned from a high fat diet to almost like, I don't want to say low fat, but like definitely more moderate fat. I eat a lot of more of my fuel from carbohydrates these days. So I would say I probably am like hitting like 150 to 200, depending, 200 grams, depending on um, the day. Um, I don't really track, so I just make sure like I'm kind of following my cravings and my energy levels. So even though calories, like a lot of people are like, calories out, calories in, does not matter at all. And I'm like, it doesn't matter like tremendously, but it does matter for you, your output to match your input. So if you're sitting all day long and then you're going home and laying and binging and watching Netflix, it's probably not a day where you need to eat like seven balanced meals and 2,500 calories. But on a day when you go and like do CrossFit and you walked around the zoo, um, you probably do need 2,500 calories. You know what I mean? So you want to actually like match your intake with your output. It's not about like obsessing over the numbers. It's just more like on the days where I'm more stressed or I'm doing more activity, I'm going to be hungrier. I'm going to need more fuel. On the days that I'm not, I'm probably going to need less and that's okay. Um, but I'm going to listen to my body above all else. So there are some days where I hit more fats and proteins than carbs, like sometimes, but I never, ever, 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 ever go underneath a hundred grams of carbohydrates ever, ever, ever. Like I, um, I love to like put emphasis on that because I don't think it's safe to go um, below a certain amount of carbs. Everyone's different, so I will preface that by saying that if your tolerance is low, especially if someone has been on like a low carb or a keto diet for a really long time, the tolerance for carbs is going to be quite low. And so it's not like, oh, I'm eating 40 grams now. Maybe I should be eating 200 because Jessica told me to eat 200. Like that's a bad idea, you know. Um, and unfortunately, you're going to blow up like a balloon. That's just the thing. The the stream of things because your body has become so used to burning free fatty acids and even though that's metabolically unstable that's what your body has has adapted to and so you have to slowly get your body back to actually burning its preferred source of fuel which is glucose and it's going to take time at first it's probably going to say i don't really care for glucose i've learned to burn fat and uh, i know in our culture that's being touted as a good thing but burning free fatty acids it's, it's metabolically inflammatory it it produces a lot of metabolic toxins that the liver has to process so um it's one of those things where you kind of have to slowly tell the fu the body what fuel you're going to have it burn and if you've been telling your body fat for so long and then you're going to take it back to the other side you have to kind of slowly do it and so in that case you slowly lower fat and you slowly raise carbohydrates to find your sweet spot and that could that process could take a year you know like it's it might take you a year to get to that point all the while you're making sure because remember the gut and the liver completely determine how your body is going to burn carbs. If you're the type of person that just blows up like a balloon whenever you eat a normal amount of carbs, there's a metabolic issue there. That does not mean carbs are bad for you. That means there's some serious imbalance going on in both the gut and the liver and probably the T3, your T3 levels, which is usually due to the gut and liver. So those are the things that need work. You don't need to be like, oh, I'm gonna restrict carbs and actually further stress out my liver. Um, that's the wrong approach. It's more like, let's see this for what it is. There's a metabolic issue at stake. We've gotta get the body processing its preferred source of fuel again. And so that's going to take some time, but I eat probably like 150 to 200. I kind of still play around on certain days. Um, but again, that's always combined with protein and fat. Like a lot of people are like, how do you eat so many carbs and not gain weight? I'm like, I never eat carbs alone. Like ever, ever, ever. <laughs>
Breaking out in cold sores on my face with swollen lymph nodes and recently eczema. Lysine has helped, but it's still, could this be a gut sensitivity or histamine issue? That sounds like a viral issue for sure. And um, whenever the lymph nodes are swollen and there's any type of, remember, like any kind of cold sore is totally viral in nature. Um, have you ever gotten tested for Epstein-Barr or Lyme's disease or anything like that? Because that sounds pretty viral in nature, but it can absolutely be a gut issue. Remember that viruses, um, your 80% of your immune system is in your gut. And so if you are getting constant viral outbreaks, it's probably a gut issue for sure. And that is, has everything to do with your immune system and your metabolic function. Because whenever it comes to these very obscure viruses, you guys, or these obscure illnesses, you know, people are like, oh, you have a hidden illness. And I'm like, yeah, you probably do. But a healthy body would be able to handle a virus, no problem. It's the fact that the body can no longer handle those things. And so we got to focus on what the issue is. We want to support the systems of the body so that it can, can help with those things. But sometimes in that case, like a castor oil pack on your lymph nodes can be very helpful because castor oil really draws um, toxins out of the body. And then um, I really like uh, loricidin for that. Um, I can show you the one that I use. Hold on. Sorry, I'm like, it's like show and tell today, but I know you guys like to see. Hold on. So, um, sorry. So loricidin or monolaurin, I get this one because it um, is it's a better deal. I've had this since like January and I still have quite a bit. There's 200 servings in this. This is Inspired Nutrition Monolaurin Pellets and it actually is a, um, a pellet. So this is really good for like viruses, um, Lyme's disease. Just be very, so it's like little pellets and it's very good for things like this. Um, it helps keep like cold sores at bay, things like that. But I really like this for any kind of viral infection. It's helpful with lysine as well. Um, but you just want to start very conservative. This can cause severe die-off, especially if you're struggling with like an active EBV infection or Lyme's disease or something like this. This is a very powerful supplement. Um, but yeah, it can definitely be that maybe your gut is compromised, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a gut and histamine issue. I mean, whenever someone has gut issues, they usually have issues clearing histamines. That's just like a given. But uh, I never like say that something is particularly a histamine issue. I say, yeah, histamines can cause issues, but why is your body not clearing histamine? All these people that are saying like, oh, I can't clear histamine because I have MTHFR or this or that. I'm like, Pugh. it's because you, you, your body doesn't have what it needs to clear those things. You know, why would it, why would it do that? It, it wouldn't. So that's, that's my opinion. But anyways, I would really focus on detoxification and, um, I would look into getting tested for viral infections for sure. My preovulatory temps are 36.1 or lower. I read that can be a sign of hypothyroidism. Should I be concerned? Everyone that has low temps should always be concerned with low metabolic function. Um, you always want, I'm not sure what the conversion for Celsius is. I always say um, a, a, an optimal rage upon waking is uh, 97.8 to 98.6 Fahrenheit. So you're going to have to convert that to Celsius. I can't remember exactly what it is, but 97.8 is kind of the lower end of normal. Anything like trending lower than that constantly is usually a sign of low metabolic function. So you want, I mean, if you want an optimally functioning metabolism and you want to feel really good and you want to burn fat really well and you, you want to actually be metabolizing things well, then you want your temperatures between 97.8 to 98.6 when you wake up and then you want them trending higher later on in the day. You want to see them improve throughout the day um, closer to that 98.6. You know, a lot of people in the Western world are now getting those lower temperatures and unfortunately that's a sign of low metabolic function. Girl, you look so good. Love your earrings. Oh, thank you. You guys are so sweet. It's just this ring light. I'm telling you, the light matters. The light really matters. Like this thing diffuses light. I'm just like, ooh, ooh, but <laughs> it's just artificial. Question, do you know anything about girls who have hormonal problems, BO, breast, low metabolism? I'm asking for a student of mine who's only six years old. Yeah, of course. So a lot of times, see, people don't realize that kids are human beings too. Um, I, for some reason, like people act like kids are immune to health issues. Like, oh, you can feed a kid absolute crap and they'll be fine, right? I'm like, well, that's the beginning of these issues later on in life. And some some kids are exposed to um, 
things in the womb and so they're already born metabolically unstable and remember estrogens drive hormonal imbalances you know girls shouldn't go through puberty or have hormonal imbalances ever really but they shouldn't go through puberty and I shouldn't say puberty puberty should be gone through like a little later on like 11 12 13 um when you start having like all these hormonal imbalances at six years old that's way too young but you have to look at that that little girl's diet you have to look at is she chugging you know estrogen like um conventional dairy products all the time eating like crap is her liver detoxification impaired everything i talk about here absolutely applies to a young girl um, except she's not really supposed to be cycling yet she's not supposed to be getting breasts yet or anything like that so it's like one of those things where you have to kind of look at what what's her environment like I mean there's so many factors like what's going on and um, get to the bottom of it usually it's death by a thousand cuts in those situations but whenever someone has um, is getting like um, early on puberty then that usually is a sign that they're being exposed to way too much estrogen whether it's from the water from the food um, from multiple sources liver detoxification is impaired I mean everything I talk about here applies but it's just gonna get worse from there unfortunately Eight ounces of orange juice, two tablespoons of collagen, one cup of raw milk, and two tablespoons of coconut cream, posting for anyone. Yeah, so it's either two tablespoons of coconut cream or raw milk, not both. I know you're not crazy for nuts, what about beans and legumes? It's the same, you guys. So any um, plant source of food that is very difficult to break down is the plant's future. You have to understand beans, nuts, seeds, grains, they're the plant's future. It's the plant putting everything it has to make sure the next generation of plants makes it. And a lot of people say that, well, that's because, and that's why seeds are so nutrient dense. And I'm like, they are nutrient dense, but they can't be digested very well. Like they have all these plant chemicals and, and, and um, compounds that make it very difficult for them to digest uh, for the purpose of they want to make it all the way through the digestive system and come out on the other side because remember human beings used to squat and poop on the dirt and then, ooh, baby plant grows five months later. You know what I mean? So we have to understand that these plants are living things as well. They might not be living creatures, but they are living and they are intelligent and they are, they don't want to be eaten at all. And so animals pre-break down the stuff like cows have three stomachs, chickens have gizzards. There are animals that actually have the mechanisms to break these foods down in the proper way. Last time I checked, you only had one stomach. Last time I checked, you didn't have a gizzard. And so, um, it's very difficult for the human body to digest these foods unless you're very robust. You are, are metabolically and gut robust, meaning you have amazing, incredible digestion, metabolism, you're all good. If you are, you, you know, I, I suspect that you're not. A lot of the women here are not, and so that's why they're here. They're trying to find answers to their problems. And um, the harder the food is to break down and digest, I just want you to think that, remember, your gut is very delicate skin. That's what it is. It's delicate skin inside your body. And so imagine taking, you know, uh, a bean and just rubbing it against, like, very delicate skin. That's very difficult to digest and break down. So I'm not against them um, in s small moderation. Um, peanuts to me are out though. Peanuts are a legume and they are definitely out. They are very difficult to digest and full of mycotoxins or mold. And most people can't handle them. Um, unless again, you're very metabolically and gut robust. Um, and then for like beans, it's one of those things where if you soak them and pressure cook them, they probably are going to be a lot easier to digest, but like just regular canned beans, um, are not going to be very easy to digest. Um, and then legumes, it's kind of one of those things where like, I don't recommend getting like a majority of your starches from them, but if you want to have like some lentils here and there, I wouldn't worry about it. It's just more like, remember guys, we eat for our goals. You want to be metabolically robust? Stop eating like a pig. Stop eating like a chicken. Stop eating like a bunny. Eat like a human being. And um, 
human beings are omnivores. We are, are uh, naturally drawn to foods that are nutrient dense and easy to digest and break down as sources of fuel. We're drawn to foods that an animal has already broken down for us and turned into a nutrient dense source. Um, and we can fight that all we want, but um, we're gonna have a very hard time uh, digesting food. So um, that's just my take. But again, I always recommend doing what works for you. If you feel like beans and legumes make you feel like the best version of yourself, then by all means, consume them. Good morning, you look amazing. Thank you guys, you guys are so sweet. <laughs> I have been having night sweats two weeks before my period starts, what can I do about this? Liver detoxification all the way, girl. That is, those, those are those estrogen sweats. Um, so make sure your progesterone levels are good. I know I always say this, like I sound like a broken record, but like it's, it's the case. In most cases, women's progesterone is low. Women's liver detoxification is impaired because that second half of the cycle is just, uh, there's a lot more hormones at play that the liver has to take care of. And a lot of times estrogen um, sticks around in the body longer than it's supposed to. Make sure you're pooping every single day hopefully twice a day if you can. Um, you're trying to get things metabolically moving. You, you want things mo mobile, you want motility going, and you want your body passing all that waste, um, taking out the trash very quickly so that stuff doesn't stick around and reabsorb in the body. So make sure you're pooping regularly, make sure your liver's being detoxified, and make sure that your progesterone levels are good. And a lot of times that takes care. Another thing that can happen is cortisol can be high because remember that second half of your cycle when progesterone is introduced, our metabolism starts speeding up. We actually have more needs for glucose and more needs for fuel. I actually see a lot of women on like a keto diet getting really, really bad night sweats and anxiety the second half of their cycle because they're not realizing that once progesterone comes into play, your body prefers metabolizing glucose and it makes the cells really pick up glucose a lot better. This is why progesterone is so helpful for people that have insulin resistance or um, type two diabetes. And so what can happen is if you're not eating very regularly or being responsible and consistent about eating or eating a bedtime snack, you can, during the night, actually get, you're getting adrenaline and cortisol spiking because the body needs fuel because the body's burning through fuel a lot quicker. And so in that case, it's just a matter of eating a bedtime snack right before you go to bed and then maybe even having, I have that de-stress drink, the orange, the raw milk, the salt, and the collagen um, on, you you know in the fridge ready to go or on the bedside table and every time you wake up with a night sweat you chug that down so some the, some salt and sugar combo is really helpful in cooling the stress response quite quickly no estrogen dominant symptoms no digestive inflammation but high androgens yeah, then there's something going on for sure. Um, people are, you don't just have high androgens to have high androgens. So make sure that you have progesterone in play. You have enough progesterone. Make sure you're ovulating. That's the biggest thing. Um, and then you want to make sure that um, you're eating enough. But then if there's no um, estrogen dominant symptoms, no digestive inflammation, then you want to make sure you're eating enough. You want to make sure you're not over exercising. You want to make sure you're in a relationship that's supportive and you don't feel like you're in fight or flight mode constantly. You want to make sure that you're not hating your body. If you are, you're living with the enemy. Um, and then you want to make sure that you are breathing deeply. You're getting exposed to sunlight. So if there's truly no estrogen dominance and no intestinal inflammation, where is the stress coming from? That's the question. That that must be asked and a lot of times it's the liver detoxification um, it is um, the fact that there's not enough progesterone so whenever testosterone is high you guys there's always a reason it's not like oh there's nothing else wrong it's just testosterone is high I'm sure if you dug deep enough there's something else going on it's just a matter of finding it and Prolactin should always be tested, so should DHEA. Um, those are two things that must be tested when um, hormones are imbalanced. I don't ovulate, I'm severely insulin resistant. What do you think of intermittent fasting and low carb diets plus gluten free? I think they are horrible and um, they will just metabolically suppress you for the long run. I think that um, a, a lot of times with insulin resistance, there's serious diet is or uh, gut issues at play. And so um, it's really important to get the gut tested and then also to make sure you're eating really consistently. Intermittent fasting just makes women miserable eventually. Maybe the first month they'll lose some weight, but then the second month they'll 
completely just their hair will start falling out and stuff like that. So I don't think that in insulin resistance, you have to understand that there's metabolic damage going on and going lower carb or fasting is like the exact opposite of what needs to happen in my opinion. So um, it's one of those things where I was insulin resistant once, I did that and I wish I would have known what I know now for sure because I have to now heal from actually going low carb and unfortunately you see that pretty regularly with a lot of women. Um, it's just a fad right now and you gotta put your blinders on and just go no, 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 like just wait the fad out guys, wait the fad out. It's gonna go, it's gonna be like a thing of the past soon enough, just wait it out, eat balanced. Any diet that restricts a certain macronutrient is not biologically accurate, it's just not. Okay, Luna Exposure, I see your question about elevated blood pressure. Um, Instagram's cutting me off because it's been an hour, but I'm gonna go live again. So if I didn't get to any of your guys' questions, just join me again and ask them again and I will get to them. See you in a second.